Well, school is finally out, and summer has finally started. And summer, we just said a couple minutes ago, summer is the time when you go to revival. Um, but like I also said, summer is a time where you probably will go on vacation or something like that. And I don't know if you guys like have a vacation spot where your family goes to, like, like every year, year in, year out. You go there every single year. It's like your second home. Not that you maybe have a second home there, but you go there a lot where it kind of feels that way. For, for my family, um, it wasn't necessarily Hawaii. It wasn't, you know, some crazy exotic place. Uh, my family used to go to uh, Palm Springs, Palm Desert, all the time. And in the middle of the summer, that's like 120 degrees. It's super, super hot. Um, but my family, as you know about me, I like, to, I like to golf. There's a lot of golf courses there. We like to go to the pool. We go shopping there. Um, we, we do a lot of fun stuff when we would go out there as a family every summer. And I don't know if you guys have ever, like, looked on Google Maps at, um, at, at uh, Palm Springs before. You, you, like, you zoom in on Palm Springs. It's, it's in the middle of a desert. Like, it's brown everywhere. It <laughs> and, and then out of nowhere, there's, like, this little patch of green. And actually, in I, I, I looked this up today. Uh, in the Coachella Valley, in Palm Springs, Palm Desert, La Quinta, Indio, all those cities there, there's, like, over 120 golf courses there. And that's in the middle of the desert. Like, there's no, like, lake. There's no oasis. There's nothing like that. It's out in the middle of the desert. If you know anything about grass, um, grass needs what to grow? It needs, it needs water, right? And out in the middle of the desert, where are you going to get this water from? And uh, so I was, I was looking at this stuff, and I, I, I found out that actually Palm Desert, the, the reason they can have 120 golf courses out there and water them every day is because they have an unlimited source of water out in the middle of the desert, out in the middle of nowhere, where there's no lakes or ocean or anything like that. They have an unlimited source of water. And where is that water found? It's actually found under, under the surface. So th under the surface, there's this big, um, they described it as a big, basically a big bathtub under that whole valley. And it's, and it's 100 and, or it's 1,200 feet deep. So that's like the height of the Empire State Building. But it's this big bathtub, the height of the Empire State Building, under, under the ground, and it's just loaded with gallons and gallons and, and millions and millions of gallons of water under the surface. Out in the middle of nowhere, it doesn't look like it. I, I mean, it's the middle of the desert, but they have an unlimited source of water right there under the surface. And I was, as I was learning this, I, I, as I found this out, I, I, it got me actually thinking about the, the Christian life as we talk about joy. This is our next fruit of the Spirit that we're going to talk about here this morning, joy. And I, and I, was, I, I was thinking about this, this big bathtub, 1,200 feet deep of water under Palm Springs, and uh, it got me thinking about the, the Christian life, the, 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 the bathtub, if you will, that we have under the surface that, that is this never-ending source of joy. If you're, if you're a real Christian, you, you can have an unlimited amount of joy. I don't mean you're going to like be rich and famous, and you're going to have you know, a bunch of money and all this kind of stuff. I'm not saying that, but but a real Christian, Christian is synonymous with, with joy, and you actually have a, a wellspring, a, a, a big reserve with millions and millions of gallons of water of joy under the surface. I know joy is one of those things where it seems like, you know, an emotion or it seems like, what in the world is this? The world talks about it, it's up and down. Joy is like happy, you know, it's, it, it's a good feeling that you have here and there. But today I want to look at I want to look at what the Bible has to say about joy. Look at what the Bible has to say about the unlimited resources that you have to, to, to if you will, dig a well and, and bring up that water, bring up that, 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 that joy in your own life. You've got this unwavering and uncircumstantial joy that you have under the surface that maybe you don't even realize you have if you're a Christian. So I want you guys to turn to the book of Habakkuk. If you know where that is, I'll give you a gold star. But Habakkuk, it is one of the minor prophets, so it's one of the pages in your Bible that's probably still sticking together because you've never opened it before. Um, but Habakkuk, it's five chapters to the left of Matthew. So you go find Matthew in, in, in your Bibles, and you, uh, flip, you flip left five books, Malachi, Zechariah, Haggai, Zephaniah, Habakkuk. That's when you know, you know the Bible frontwards and backwards, when you can say it frontwards and backwards. It's pretty good. I had to look that up, just, just so you know. I mean, I know the Bible, but yeah, I mean, frontwards and backwards, that's hard. But Habakkuk, five books to the left of Matthew, and uh, tell me all that you know about Habakkuk. You guys know a lot about Habakkuk? Oh, good, good for you, good for you, a minor prophet. But that's probably maybe the extent of your knowledge about this guy named Habakkuk. So uh, let, me, let me set the scene. Let me set up the story here for this guy with this really long name. And uh, he's got more K's in his name than Keith. Um, 
and uh, I had to say that, and uh, Habakkuk. So who is he? So, so we pick it up here in the Old Testament um, right before uh, Judah gets, gets exiled into Babylon. You guys know the story of King Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel and the fiery furnace and all that. So this is right, right before that. So, so they're right on the brink of that exile to Babylon. And so this guy named Habakkuk here, God, God, God he, he's a prophet. God, God talks to him and, and basically tells him what's going to happen. He tells him, hey, Babylon's going to come. He's going to take you away and he's going to discipline you for your sin. Because at this point, Israel was doing a lot of bad things. They were, they were worshiping other gods. They, were, they, they, were, um, they had uh, idols. They, they would uh, just treat people really badly. Um, they were disobeying God all over the place. And so this guy, Habakkuk, God uses him to tell these people and to warn these people, hey, guess what? You've got Babylon coming to you. So if you, I mean, we could do a quick, I, I guess, quick little survey here. This, this guy, Habakkuk, he's got a lot of questions. And I feel like I'm sympathetic to this because I feel like I'm always asking questions. I'm asking question after question. I was always that kid, not in class, because I was always the weird kid that didn't talk in class because I was afraid of, I don't know, the teacher or something like that. But I, with my parents, I would ask them question, question, question all the time. I was like the question master. And so Habakkuk here, he, he's asking God questions like, why is this happening? Why are you doing this? And so God, he, tell, he tells them, hey, Babylon's going to come. And then he starts asking questions. Why are you going to use Babylon? They're bad people. They're, they're the... Um, they're, 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 the, they're the North Korea of, of that day. Like, they were the worst of the worst people. Like, they're, they're really, really bad, really overbearing. They killed a lot of people. Um, and so Habakkuk, he's asking all these questions. And basically what God tells him is, hey, I want you to trust me. I want you to, to put your faith in me and to trust me that I know what I'm doing. And so we get to the end of this passage here. When bad things are right on the horizon here for Habakkuk, Habakkuk, he, he actually finds joy even in this terrible, terrible situation. His worst enemy, the worst people in the world, North Korea is going to come in and they're going to conquer America, if you will, and they're going to take over everything. And they're going to enslave you, take you to their land, and, and, and just humiliate you. That's the situation that he's in right now. But guess what? He finds joy even in that terrible, terrible circumstance. So Habakkuk chapter 3, that was a long time for you to get there. So hopefully you're there, you're looking at it. But Habakkuk chapter 3, look at verse 17. We're going to read 17 through, through 19 here together. Habakkuk chapter 3 verse 17 says, Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vine, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food, and the flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God, the Lord, is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on my high places. So we have this guy here. He's, he's on the brink of all this bad stuff. Life is crashing down on him. Every, every, everything that he knows about life is about to come to an end. And he still, he finds joy. And so I, I want to first define what we're talking about when we say joy. What, what do we even mean by joy? Because we think, oh, happiness, good things, you know, smiling, all that kind of stuff. But joy, just the, the textbook definition is it's a state of delight or gladness or well-being resulting from you knowing or serving God. So basically, the, 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 the state of contentment and, and delight and, and, and joy I guess I can't use the word to define the word, but the, the delight and gladness and well-being that you can now have with a relationship with God. That's, that's, what, that's what joy is. And if you were here um, last year when we were uh, over Christmas time, we talked about the angels showing up um, to the shepherds right there, right, bef right before Jesus was, or right after Jesus was born. And they announced all these people in Luke chapter 2, and he says, or the angels say, they say, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. What's the good news of great joy? Well, how can we have joy? Well, Luke 2, 11, for unto you, born to stay in the city of David, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Basically, what we're trying to say here is the joy that, that we can have in life, the joy, the wellspring, it's all rooted in a relationship with Christ. The, the reason that Christ came at Christmas is to bring good news of great joy for all the people so that we can now have this, this, this state of delight and gladness and well-being from resulting in having a relationship with God. And you see, that's very different than maybe the uh, Webster Dictionary definition or the Dictionary.com def definition or the world's definition of joy because they think of joy as just a, an emotion, an up and down feeling that you have. That you feel good, you feel bad, or well, you can feel joy, you can feel sadness. Well, the idea of joy here in the, in the, in the Bible is this, this idea that you can always have this uncircumstantial. Life, life can be 
It can be bad just like Habakkuk here. Life can be crashing down, but you can find this, this delight and this gladness in your relationship with God. No one can take that away. You can dig into that, that well under the, under the surface of that 1,200-foot deep bathtub under the surface that no one else could see. You can pull up that, that joy because you have a relationship with God. It's not a passive emotion, but rather joy. I mean, we've talked about the fruit of the Spirit. It's something that you have to put on. It's a choice. It's a decision that you have to make to put on this joy. So I want you guys... To, to write this down from point number one, you need to choose joy in any circumstance. That's what we see here with Habakkuk. He chooses joy in every and any circumstance. Joy, it's not an emotion. It, it, it's, a, it's, a, it, it's a choice. It's something that you have to put on, something that you have to say, hey, guess what? I'm going to be joyful even through tough times, even through the hard times. I'm going to be joyful. I'm going to put it on, just like I put on love, just like I put on peace, patience, kindness, any of those other things. You have to willfully put those on. And so here we, we read this weird little thing about all these different agricultural things, fig trees and vines and olives and fields and flocks and herds and all that kind of stuff. So what is Habakkuk talking about here? Well, like I said, Babylon here, they're about to come in and they're about to conquer conquer uh, Judah. They're going to conquer God's people. They're going to enslave them and take them away to, a, to, their, to their foreign land. And so Habakkuk, what he's trying to say here is, hey, things are getting really bad. And he says it in this really poetic way. And if you add all of these things up, this fig tree and the fruit and the olives and all this stuff, it's this, it's this disaster, the social economic disaster that he's trying to describe here. So maybe you don't understand the fig tree or the, the vines or anything. So I'm going to help you here understand it. So figs, what are we talking about when we say Though the fig tree should not blossom. What Habakkuk is trying to say here is that the, the, the good things of life were um, coming to an end, basically. You see a fig tree. I don't know if you like figs. I think figs are really weird. I like fig newtons. Maybe that's about as far as I'll go. Um, uh, Jen buys f- these fig things, um, these fig bars for the, for the office, for the staff, and she puts them in the in the thing, and I've tried those, and they're disgusting because they're not fig newtons. Um, fig newtons are the only kind of figs that I will ever eat, but figs back in those days were like the delicacy, like the best stuff that you could have. So it's like, think in and out or you think, in my, in my terms, uh, do you think Del Taco? Like the greatest thing you could ever have is like Del Taco. And so if they took away Del Taco, it'd be a disaster for, for me. If they took in and out maybe it'd be a disaster for you, or Chick-fil-A, or one of those things that you really love taken away. And so that's what Habakkuk is trying to say here. Fig trees should not blossom. The, the, the good things in life, the delicacies, the luxuries in life are done. But if that happened, if in and out closed, if, if uh, dare I say it, if Del Taco closed all around the world, they went out of business. I don't know how. Um, well, I guess their food's really cheap, so maybe that's how. Um, and I'm the only one that goes there. But if Del Taco closed and, and there were no more Del Tacos in the world, I think I would survive. I would be, I would be okay. It wouldn't be great, but I would, I would manage. And so that's what, that's what Habakkuk is trying to say here. But then he, he goes on. He get these, uh, each time they get worse and worse and worse. And so he says, though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines. So what he's talking about here is the idea of, uh, of, of wine. So basically, back in those days, you either had, you had two drinks that you could have. You could have water or you could have wine. Those are the only two things that you could drink. Everything else, there was no soda, there's no LaCroix, there's no lemonade, there's no... Arnold Palmer, there's no Red Bull, there's no coffee, there's nothing like that. And so uh, there's no, there's no, well, I guess they could make juice, but I don't think they, they really did. They, they, made, they made wine and they made water, or they didn't make water, but they had water. And those were the only two things that they could drink. So think about this for a minute. They take away every drink in the world, and you can only drink water for the rest of your life. That'd be a little worse than Del Taco closing, wouldn't it? Like, y- you can only drink water for the rest of your life. Like, that's good for you, but... I mean, sometimes I, I, I really, really need some coffee. Or I really need, you know, a, cu- a glass of, of expired Mexican Coke. Like, I really, really need that. Um, if you were there on Friday, we had some expired Coke. And I didn't feel bad. Did you feel bad? I, I thought we were fine. Like, I, I think we could do it again next week. Like, come, come on, we're going to drink some more expired more Coke. But, but anyway, I- if we had nothing but water to drink, we would, we would probably be okay. It would be awful. It would be really bad but we'd probably be okay. But here it gets worse. He says the produce on the olive fail. So the next thing here is the idea of olives. That's where they got their oil. So we're thinking that that's how they would make cakes. That's how they would make bread. That's how they would basically make any kind of baking 
anything. Is it, it had, you, you needed oil. And you think about our, our world right now. We need oil for just about everything. Like everything you eat. Uh, the french fries at Del Taco, you need oil for that. And like those are so good. They're the, they're, I, they're, I shouldn't say they're the best french fry, but I really like the, the, the Del Taco french fries. But you need oil for that. You need oil for, for most foods. But then it gets worse. He says the fields yield no food. So now we've got no food. Now everything is done. You go to the, you go to the, uh, you go to Target, you go to Stater Brothers, you go to your grocery store, and there's nothing there. That would be a really, really bad, really, really bad situation. But then it gets worse. He says that they're, the flock be cut off from the fold. So everyone in that time, they were pretty much some kind of shepherd. They had some kind of animals, and this is how they survive. So we're talking like job now. So you've got no Del Taco. You've got no nothing to drink but water. You've got no oil. You've got no food now. And now you've got no job. And so now things are getting really bad. And then he says now there's no, no herd in the stall. And that's another idea of this job now I- is done. You can't have any anything. You can't make money in any way. You've got no food. You've got no Del Taco. Things are looking really, really bad. So what the fact is trying to say here is life is about to get really bad. Babylon's coming in. They're going to conquer us. We're going to have nothing. They're going to destroy us. Our worst enemy is going to conquer us. But you look at verse 18. He says, even though all of those things are happening, even though all of those, those things are about to happen, verse 18, yet, I think that's a, that's a small little English word, but that carries a lot of meaning. Yet, even though all of that is true, nevertheless, regardless of, of that situation, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. You see, this is a choice that he has to make in any circumstance. When things are, are really, really bad, Babylon's about to come in and conquer you. Things are not looking good. He chooses, guess what? I can, I can choose joy in any situation. He, he tells himself, I have to put this on. I have to remember the well that I have under the surface. I need to draw from that. And you remember that I have a relationship with God, and that's the most important thing that anyone could ever have. If you take away everything in life, and I still have that, I have everything I need. Habakkuk says, I'm going to find joy. I'm going to rejoice in the Lord. I think the Bible talks about this all over the place. We, we want you to put joy on, but joy is actually a command. Philippians 4 verse 4 says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Paul here, he's, he's saying that you have to do this. This is not like a suggestion. This is not like something the AP Christian does. Like everyone, you must rejoice in the Lord. It's a commandment. It's a sin to not rejoice in the Lord is what Paul says in Philippians chapter 4. You see, you think of any other fruit of the Spirit. We talked about love last week. That requires effort and, and hard work. You think, you know, peace, patience, kindness, all of those things. Those require hard work, and those require you to think about them to be disciplined. Joy, it's, we think of it as an emotion, but it's actually the same thing. It's something that we have to, to put on, talk to ourselves. I don't know if you guys talk to yourself. Do you talk to yourself? I, I sometimes do. I'm, I, I'm a little weird, I guess. I, I've ta- talked to myself, like in the car sometimes. I talk to myself. Um, you know, it looks like I'm talking on the phone, but I'm not really talking on the phone. I'm just talking to myself. Um, but talking to yourself is actually, it's, a, it's actually a biblical thing to do. Maybe not verbally talking to yourself, but the Bible never commands you to verbally talk to yourself. But to, to force yourself to do something, I have to talk to myself every time my alarm goes off, right? Every time your alarm goes off, you talk to yourself in the way of, all right, I don't want to get up, but I have to get up because I've got to, you know, get dressed or whatever. You, you talk to yourself. And I love what, what David says in Psalm 42. In Psalm 42, 15, David's talking to himself here, and he says, Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall praise him again. What, what David is, is saying here in Psalm 42 is, I have to do this. I, I, I'm, I, I'm talking to myself. I need to hope in God. He's commanding himself to hope in God. And this is exactly what Habakkuk's doing here. He's, he, he's telling himself, hey, bud, you got to wake up. You got to you got to rejoice in God regardless of your situation. Joy it's not dependent on your circumstance. And the thing is about Habakkuk, bad things are about to happen to Habakkuk and guess what? In the Christian life bad things are always going to happen to you. I know that's not the the popular thing to say, but bad things are going to happen to you. If you're if you're a Christian, trials, punishment, all these different bad things are going to come your way, but we have to choose to put on joy. I want you guys to turn to James chapter 1, to James chapter 1. 
Flip on over to the New Testament, James chapter 1. I love what this, was, what this passage says here about you finding joy in every situation, in the bad situations, in the trials that come your way. You have to put on joy. You have to th- cognitively tell yourself, hey, even though this is bad, even though I want to pout, even though I want to be sad, even though I want to be depressed, I have to put on joy. James chapter 1, look at verse 2 here with me. James chapter 1 verse 2 says, Count it all joy. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness or, 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 or sureness. When steadfastness, having its full effect, you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. What this passage says here is that you have to put on joy when bad stuff comes your way. When you, when you meet a trial, God gives you a trial. God gives you bad things in your life for the sake of, of growing you if you're a Christian. It's because God cares about you when bad things happen. I don't know if you've had bad stuff happen, like you, you think maybe your family situation, like it's really not going well right now, or you know your dad gets fired, or something like that. Like bad things happen, and I, I'm not naive to the fact that even though you're young, even though you know you've only been alive for you know 13 years or whatever, 15 years, 16 years, you, like bad things have still probably happened to you. You've gone through rough stuff at school, at home, on your sports teams. When that stuff happens, James says you got to wake up. When your alarm goes off, you got to wake up. You got to tell yourself, I'm getting out of bed. When a bad thing happens, you got to tell yourself, guess what? I have to put on joy. I have to remember that I have a relationship with God. This is the most important thing that I, I could ever need or have, and I have that. God sends trials to, to, to strengthen you. Right here it says that he, he, you count it all joy, not because the bad things are good things, but you, you count it all joy when you meet trials of various kinds because you know that, that this testing of your faith, it produces a steadfastness. God is trying to mature you and grow you so that, verse 4, you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. You see, God grows us through trials. God grows, grows us through punishment. Sometimes you're in a bad situation because you've done something wrong. If you've been punished by your, your mom or dad or something like that, you understand what punishment is. You know, God does the same thing. When you sin, God punishes you, punishes you. but he does that because he wants you to, to learn. He wants you to grow. So bad things are going to happen. They're assured to happen, but you have to cognitively choose joy in any circumstance. But you're sitting here like, okay, what, like, what does that actually mean? I get it. Like, I can have joy in any circumstance. I understand that I, I, I can put this on even when bad things happen, but how do I actually do it? Well, if you're in Habak- if you're still in Habakkuk, look, look back at verse 18 here with me. How do, how do I have this joy? Where, where do I find this joy? Verse 18, Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 18. He says, even though all this stuff is true, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. And then I love what he says right here. It sounds redundant, but it's not. He says, I will take joy in the God of my salvation. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. That's how we are going to find joy, is is in the God of our salvation. The relationship that you have, the trust that you have in God, you can find joy in that relationship. I want you guys to write down for point number two, find joy rooted in your trust in God. That's how you're going to put it on. That's where you're going to find this joy. You don't just tell yourself, hey, you know, my my dad just got laid off or my parents just got a divorce. You know what? I'm just going to be happy through it. Like, that's not what joy is. It's, it's, hey, God, God knows what he's doing. God cares about me. I trust him that whatever's happening to me, even if it's not good, even if, if it's not fun, I'm going to choose to trust in God, and that's where I can find this joy, in the God of my salvation. I think there's three different aspects, three different wells or reserves, you can say, I think that it is in this phrase that you can purposely put joy on because of. And I think the first aspect of this, I, you see in your Bible, it says God of, sal- of my salvation with a lowercase s. You see that? Well, I think that may completely be the case. And that, th- I mean, that might be the correct way to think about this. A salvation, not in a, um, I almost said salvation in the salvation sense, but in a, in a sense of you being saved from your sin. Jesus dying on the cross, you being forgiven of your sin. I, I, it might be saying that, it might not be, but I think that we can take 
the, the example that we can have, the, 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 the reason for you to rejoice in a bad situation because you have a God of capital S salvation. So you write down, if you're taking sub points, rejoice because I have, we have the God of capital S salvation. Rejoice because we have the God of capital S salvation. I think it, it's so important for us when anything bad is going on, like I said earlier, the, your world can come crashing down on you. You know, just like Habakkuk here, North Korea could come in, take us, exile us to North Korea, and enslave us for the rest of our lives. And that could happen, but no one, if you're a Christian, no one can take your salvation away from you. That is the greatest joy that you can have in life. You don't need to turn there, but Luke chapter 15, we actually looked at Luke 15 when we were, when we were uh, at Winter Retreat. We talked about the prodigal son, but the prodigal son, it's, it's, it's in this collection of parables and uh, there's this parable of the lost sheep, of the lost coin, and the prodigal son, or the lost son. And I, and I love the joy that there is in this passage. And Jesus is trying to communicate to these people, hey, guess what? When, when someone becomes a Christian, when someone gets saved, when someone repents of their sin and God forgives them of their sin, there is such great joy. I love what he says, Luke chapter 15, verse 3. He says, he told them a parable. This is the parable of lost sheep. What man of you having a hundred sheep, he loses one, does he not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the one that he has lost until he, has find it, until, he, until he finds it? And when he's found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together all of his friends and neighbors and says, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Jesus, is, he's obviously being... He's obviously giving hyperbole here. He's not actually saying that righteous people don't need to repent of their sin. But what he is trying to say here is there is so much joy when anyone repents. There's no greater joy in the world than when someone gets saved. So if you are a Christian and you have experienced that salvation, there is no greater joy than that. Like I said, you could lose everything. But I love what Matthew 10, 28 says. It says you can't fear those who kill the body, but... It, you, or you don't need to fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear the one who can destroy both body and soul in hell. What Matthew is trying to, or what Jesus is trying to say here is that at the end of the day, people can take whatever they want from you. They could even kill you. North Korea could come in and kill us all. But they could not take away the salvation that you have. You, they cannot take away the relationship that you have with God. We need to remind ourselves of that when bad things are happening, when, when, when school is not going well, when, when family situation, things are looking really bad. When you're going through a tough situation, remember, hey, guess what? If I'm a Christian, I have a relationship with God. My sins are forgiven. That's my biggest, my, my, my biggest problem has been solved. I mean, think about that. You could lose your house. Your dad and mom could lose their job. You could have nothing. You could be on the street begging for bread. That could be you on the street with a little cardboard sign. But guess what? Even if that happened, no one, you cannot lose your salvation. You cannot lose a relationship with God. No one can take, a, take that away from you. You need to remind yourself of that when things are really bad, because guess what? They, things can never become that bad where you lose that. You guys, turn over to Romans chapter 8 here with me, and I'll show you that what, what, a, what a perfect passage to turn to if, if you're going through a tough time and you're trying to remind yourself of the joy that you can have in Christ. Romans chapter 8. It's one of the, obviously, the most famous chapters in all of the Bible. And I don't think there's ever any time I've read this chapter in my life where I've not left it feeling the joy that you can have in Christ, the joy that you have in salvation. Look at verse 1. If you're a Christian, this is true. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Look down the page at verse, uh, look at verse 35. Read this and try not to be joyful if you're a Christian. Romans 8, 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or the sword? Verse 37. No, in all of these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that there is neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation that will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Right now, life could come crashing down on you. And this verse still applies 
if you're a Christian. You can't lose this. Death, no life, angels, rulers. That superfluous. It's, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't mean anything because nothing can ever separate you from the love of God. If you are a Christian, you cannot lose that. You always have that. So if you're a real Christian and you read that verse and that doesn't make you joyful, then I don't, I don't really know what your problem is. Because that right there, I mean, that's the well. That like Romans chapter 8, that's the well that you can dig into and bring up that water from that, that well under the surface. And you can always have that. Life could be t- terrible, but you will never, you, you, you can't lose that right there. So rejoice because God, because we have the God of capital S salvation. But if you notice Habakkuk 3, it a- had a lowercase s. And so what Habakkuk is trying to say here is we need to rejoice because we have the God of lowercase s salvation. We have a faithful God that is there for us, saving us in our, in our time of need when, when bad stuff is happening. First thing is we rejoice because we have the God of capital S salvation, but now we can rejoice because we have the God of lowercase s salvation. You see, look at verse 19 here. Look at the beautiful declaration of faith that Habakkuk has. He says, God, the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on high places. What he's saying here is, I trust God. Even though he's questioning God throughout this whole book, even though he's like, God, you don't know what you're doing. You don't, why are you doing this? I don't know if you've ever been in that position where you're questioning God. Why are you doing this? Why are you doing this? Why are you doing this? He says here, guess what? God, I, I trust you. You're, the, you're my strength. You're going to make my feet like the deer's. I'm not going to fall. I'm, I'm stable. I'm secure. And I, and I, I, I love, if you, if you look at verse 19, the word God there, doesn't have any lowercase letters, does it? It's all capital letters in your, in your Bible, right? Well, that's because right here, what Habakkuk is calling for is he's calling out the, the covenant name of God, Yahweh. And they, they revered that name so much that they wouldn't even write it with vowels. Or, or some people, they would just write four dots because it was four letters long. They weren't allowed to say this, but they were allowed to, they were allowed to write it with no vowels. But what this name is here is the name that God gave to these people and said, this is, my, this is my name that you can always call upon and I will always hear you and I, and, and I promise my faithfulness to you and I will never leave you, I'll never forsake you. This is, this is my name that only you have. No one else c- can say my name is this. This is, this is my name. And so basically what, what, what Habakkuk is saying here is, he's saying, God, I know you're gonna be faithful. You made a covenant to these people. You said you're never gonna leave us, never forsake us. I, I trust you. I think it's so interesting that he uses that word. Even when his life is crashing down on him, he pleads with God. He says, God, basically, remember your faithfulness to me. You guys know the story of Job, right? The story of Job is this guy, this righteous, righteous man, and God allows Satan to come in and take everything from him. His family dies. I mean, he, every, like, they destroy his house. They, they steal everything he has. And, and life crashes down for him. And the whole time he's, he's, questioning, he's questioning God. Why are you doing this? Why are you doing this? But then I, I love right at the end of Job. Job chapter 40 verse 4. He says, he, he, he remembers who he is and who God is. And how big God is and how small he is. He says, behold, I'm of small account. What shall I answer to you? I lay my hand over my mouth. I, I love that, that picture of guess what God? I'm not going to question you anymore. I'm going to lay my hand over my mouth, and I'm just going to trust you. I, I love that. I love that picture. And I, I, I understand this so well because I feel like maybe you're the same way where sometimes you do question God. God, why is this happening? Why are you doing this? Why is this bad thing happening to me? But this declaration of faith that Habakkuk has, this declaration of faith that Job has, guess I'm just going to put my hand over my mouth, and I'm just going to trust you, God, that you know what you're doing. And guess what? God delivers every single time. He knows best. He's always faithful. I always think that he's batting a thousand baseball. And you, I mean, that's the idea of you, he never strikes out. He never doesn't get a hit. He always hits a home run, if you will. He, he can't lose. He can't strike out. God does. He comes through every single time. I know I've said this before, but trusting God, it's like knowing the end of the story because he's got everything figured out. You guys like, 
we watch Finding Nemo, but if you think about like Finding Nemo, why do we even watch Finding Nemo? Like think about that for a minute. Literally the end of the story is in the name. Like we know what's going to happen in the end by just listening to the name. There's Finding Nemo. There, the movie, it's about Finding Nemo, and I'm assuming that if it's made by Disney, they're probably going to find Nemo in the end, right? We know the story before it even starts. And guess what? Trusting in God is like knowing the end of the story before it even starts. God, I know you're going to come through. I know you're going to, y- you aren't going to fail me now. You've hit a home run every time. Why are you going to strike out today? We can have complete confidence in God, and that, the trust that you have gives you joy. He says, you make my feet like the deer's. If you think about like a, a deer's feet, I mean, they, they I, I wish I could draw it or had a picture, but like they have like that, I don't know how else to describe it other than like a backwards knee, like right at the end. <laughs> like, uh, you know what I mean? Like it just like, it just hooves like that way. And so their, their, their feet is secure. And if you think about a deer or a, a, a goat or something like that, they can climb up the mountain, like climb up rocks and they can just like walk up, you know, a straight rock or something like that. And so what, what he's trying to say here is, God makes my steps secure. I, n- I know like a, like a deer who's not going to fall off a mountain because his feet are secure. He's got the weird backwards knee thing. He's not going to fall down. That's what he's saying. He's saying, I, 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 I'm, 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 I find joy in God because I know that he's going to take care of me. I know that I've got security in God. I know I'm going to be taken care of. I know you guys are asking, like, why do you hate camping? You know why I hate camping? Because camping is like the opposite of security. Like I love sleeping, you know, I love going unconscious every night. Think about that. You go unconscious every night. I love doing that behind a locked door, like at my house, like it, it, a locked door. And then like I lock our bedroom door too. Like I'm, I'm secure in there. Like you can't, you can't come and get me. Like you can try, but you can't come and get me. Okay. But guess what? When you camp, no security. You're just, you're laying unconscious out in the middle of nowhere. Anyone could come kill you. Anyone could come take all your stuff. They can take your keys out of your pocket. They could get in your car. They could drive away. They could steal everything. Because you're unconscious. You can't like, you can't do stuff when you're asleep. You can't like stop the intruder when you're asleep, right? That's why I like hotels. Because guess what? On a hotel, you've got the lock thing. And guess what? You also have the little bar thing that you like, you flip over the little thing so that you can't open the door from the outside. Like, you're locked in there. You're safe. You're secure. But all you weirdos that like camping, you have no security. You like that. Is that like a thrill to you? Like, I, I, I just can't wait for someone to kill me tonight. Like, <laughs> you can come, come rob me. Take my car. Hey, like, years. But I'm just saying, I, I like going to sleep secure behind a locked door. The, the, the uncomfortable, the, the non-contented that you can have when you're camping because anyone could take you, kill you, because you're not secure. You're unconscious for eight hours, and you're not secure. And that feeling of uneasiness that you have is the opposite of the feeling that you can have in Christ. You're behind the tightest locked door ever to be produced, like when you're with God. You're completely safe. You're completely taken care of. You can trust Him, and He will deliver. Every trial, every bad situation that you come across, you can find joy in the God of your lowercase s salvation because you know that he's a faithful God to you. I think another aspect here, I told you we've got three, three ways that you can find joy. You can find joy because you have a God of capital S salvation. Your sins are taken care of. Your biggest problem you could ever have, it's, it's done, taken care of. You can rejoice because you have a God of lowercase s salvation. He's going to save you fr- from, from tough situations. But also we can rejoice because we have the God of future salvation. If you were over there in the main service, Pastor Elodie talked about the fact that we need to think of our life in terms of eternity. We need to remember that we, this is not the end of it. Your 75 years that you live here on this planet, that's not the end. There's an eternity. We can rejoice because we have the God of future salvation. Everything right now, it's temporary, it's fleeting, but we can look forward we can find joy in the fact that, guess what? This is not all there is. Guess what? They could, they could kill me. They could do whatever. I could go camping, and I could lay out, go unconscious in my tent, and someone could kill me. And guess what? That's okay because I have joy, not in this life, but I- in the next one. I've got confidence in that. There's a joy rooted in the future that is awaiting you. And you see, when things are going hard for you, things are going bad for you, life is really hard, those are the times when you just cannot wait 
for eternity. You can't wait to get there. I've told you guys about my, my little sister who was born with spina, spina bifida. She had a hole in her spine, and so she, she's disabled from the, from the knees down, so she has to wear leg braces. She can't, she can't run. She can't jump. She can't do any of these things on her own, you know, just out of the wheelchair. And whenever we talk about heaven, she gets way more excited than I do. And why do you think that is? She gets way more excited than me about the new body that she's going to have. Why? Because I can run. I can jump. I can do normal stuff. I live a really normal life. But she, she can't do that. She doesn't have that. She's disadvantaged. She waits in greater anticipation because she's in a tough position. She's like, I cannot wait until one day I can just walk normally. I can't wait till one day I could actually jump and get my feet off the ground. I cannot wait for that day. That is going to be so great. And I think she has a different perspective than I do because of her situation. And when you're going through something bad, when you're going through something tough, you've got a greater perspective because you're like, this is bad, but guess what? It's going to get so much better. I love what 1 Peter chapter 4 says. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12 through 13, it says, Beloved, do you don't, do you be not surprised by the fiery trials when they, when they come to you upon, upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice insofar as you share in Christ's suffering that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. What Peter's trying to say here is you can rejoice when bad things are happening because guess what? You're going to rejoice that much greater in heaven. See, it doesn't make sense for you to have joy in a bad situation, but you can because you know that something great is on the horizon. Something amazing is right on the brink. It's like, it's like finals week. You guys just took finals. You're out of school. You're at summer. But like, think about finals week for a second. Final, finals week is awful, right? Like finals week is not fun. But when you're sitting there studying for your test, studying for your finals, you're excited at the same time. You're motivated at the same time. Why? Because summer's right on the other side of this hard situation. It's hard to do finals, but guess what? I'm going to push through finals because on the other side is freedom. Summer, I'm done. No more homework, no more school. You push through that tough finals week because you've got something good on the other side of finals week. That's the idea of Habakkuk right here. He finds joy because he knows, guess what? When I'm dead and gone, when, when the worst situation comes and I, and, I, and I die, guess what? I'm still going to have a relationship with God. I still am going to find joy in that. We don't have time to turn there, but I want you guys to write down Revelation chapter 21, 1 through 8. That's in your discussion questions. We're going to talk about it on Friday. But if you have time to read that, that's just a picture of what the new Jerusalem is going to look like, what heaven is going to be like. The no pain, no tears that, that you can have, the, the no pain or tears that you will have in heaven, the, the relationship, the, the perfect relationship that you will now have with God. That's going to come, and we need to live in anticipation for that, live excited about that. Remember that when we're going through a tough time, guess what? I can find joy because guess what? That's going to happen. I can't wait for that day. You see, capital S salvation, lowercase s salvation, future salvation, those things are only for you if you are a Christian. If you're not a Christian, those are not for you. You don't have salvation, capital S salvation, because guess what? You're still going to have to pay for your sins. You don't have a lowercase s salvation. When bad things are happening, you've got no guarantee that things are going to be okay and that you're growing. And you don't have anything to look forward to in a future sense of salvation. I know a lot of you guys, you sit here, and I, I even see it on your face. You don't have joy. You don't have joy. You, this doesn't make sense to you. School isn't fun. Parents aren't fun. Life isn't fun. Friends aren't fun. The life is really bad right now. And guess what? If you're not a Christian, you don't have any hope. You, you, you don't have salvation, salvation, or future salvation. That's not for you. But it can be for you. I think a lot of you guys sit here, you say, I will wait till college. I'll wait till I have kids. I'll wait till I'm married and I have my own life to, to commit my life to Christ and repent of my sins and say, guess what? I, God, I'm not going to live for myself anymore. I'm going to live for you. I'm going to leave my sins behind. I'm going to run your direction. I'm going to commit my life to obeying you for the rest of my life. And you're sitting here, uh, I'm going to wait for that. I'll do that later. I'm in eighth grade. Or I'm, in, I'm, you know, a sophomore. I do, I'm just going to do it later. Do you see how stupid that is? 
Do you realize all that you're leaving on the table? Do you realize what you're missing out on? This joy that you can have in capital S, lowercase s, and future salvation? That is not yours if you're not a Christian. You can't have that until you become a Christian. Say, God, I'm done living for myself. I'm done living for my sin. I'm going to give it up. I'm going to say, you can have it. I surrender my whole life to you. Take my life. That's the only time when you can have this salvation, salvation, and future salvation. And if you are a Christian, like I said earlier, this is something you have to purposely discipline yourself to do. Put on, choose joy. I didn't say have joy or be joyful. I said choose joy. It's something you actually have to cognitively and consciously put on and do. You have to, you have to put it on. I want you guys to write down John chapter 16. John chapter 16, verse 20 through 22. I'm going to read it here for you, and we'll close with this. But John chapter 16, 20 and 22, it's speaking to you if you're a Christian. This is Jesus talking, and he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, you weep, you lament, the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. When a woman is giving birth, she has got sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered her baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for the joy that a human being has been born into the world. So also, you have sorrow now. Life may be really hard right now, is what Jesus is trying to say, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take that joy from you. See, I've, I've never had a baby before, but I've heard it's really bad. It's really painful. It's like one star on Yelp, having a baby. Like, it's not good. It's not fun, is what I've heard. Painful. And I've asked my mom this before, because she, you know, my mom and your mom says the same thing probably, but like, I'd do it again for you because I love you so much. And I tell my mom, like, why would you do that again for me? Like, that doesn't make, like, that doesn't seem worth it, is what I tell her. But she's like, I'd do it again in a heartbeat because it was painful for a time. It hurt for a time. John 16, it was sorrowful for a time. But guess what? Once, once you came, once, once we had you, it, it's the greatest thing ever. I forgot how bad it was. And now I'm just so enamored with the joy that I can have now in bringing a human being into the world, it, d- it doesn't even compare. And guess what? You have that, if you're a Christian, you have that joy. The pain that you're going through now, you're not even going to remember it when you get to heaven because you're going to be like, this joy doesn't even compare with the, with the pain and sorrow that I had on planet Earth. So let's choose this joy. Let's put on this joy every day. Let's find this joy rooted in your trust in God of your salvation, salvation and future salvation. You can have joy. You can put on joy. So hopefully that's something that you can do this week. Hopefully that's something that I can do this week. So I'm going to pray for us right now to ask God that he would help us do that. That's something that I want to do, that you want to do. But we need help to do that because it is hard. It's hard to remember that. It's hard to put on joy when times are difficult. So let's bow our heads right now. God, we are so thankful for the relationship that we can have with you. The, The fact that we can be enemies of you, sinners, lost people. And you can now bring us into your family and call us a son or a daughter of you. That is a beautiful picture and an amazing, amazing display of your love for us. God, and we can find such great joy rooted in that relationship. We know that whatever comes our way, when when life gets really hard, we can put on joy no matter what. Because guess what? We have you. We have the God of capital S salvation. Our sins are taken care of. We have no need to worry about anything else because ultimately God has forgiven us of our biggest problem, fixed our biggest problem in life. But we can also trust you, the God of lowercase s salvation, from from situations, from trials that come our way. You can grow us through those things, God, and we want to trust you even when life is hard. And ultimately, we know that we live this life and we trust you We find joy in you because we are going to find even greater joy when we get to be with you for eternity. God, I cannot wait for that day. And as they cried long, long ago, they cried Maranatha, they cried, oh Lord, come. We we cry that here today, God. When we reflect on the the joy, the amazing joy that we will have one day with you, God, we, we want that now. We want that today. So I pray that you would come back soon. God, we are so thankful for the reserve, the joy reserve that we have under the surface. 
We can pull from it any time. We can find joy any time. Because you are a God of joy. You want us to have joy. You give us this gift of joy. I pray that we would put it on this week. That you would help us, remind us to put it on this week. God, we love you. We're so thankful for what you've done for us on the cross. Sending your son to live in our place, die in our place, so that we could be made right with you, so that we have a relationship with you, so that we can now have joy in a relationship with you. God, we are so thankful for that. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.